In Exodus chapter 18, if you would, follow with me as we begin reading with the first verse in Exodus chapter 18. And let's stand as we read from God's word and honor his word today. Exodus chapter 18, beginning there with the first verse. And Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back with her two sons, of whom the name of one was Gershom. For he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. And the name of the other was Eliezer, help, and be- delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness, where he was encamped at the mountain of God. Now he had said to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons with me. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law. He bowed down and he kissed him. And they asked each other about their well-being. And they went into the tent. And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all of the hardship that had come upon them on the way and how the Lord had delivered them. Then Jethro rejoiced for all the good which the Lord had done for Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord, who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh, and who has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods, for in the very thing in which they behaved proudly, he was above them. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices to God, And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. Lord, bless the reading of your word today. May we understand it. May it speak to us. May it change us for eternity. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Moses had been on a great adventure. Many of us are on life's great adventure. Moses was missing his wife and family through all of this study on Moses. We never heard anything about his family. When Moses was called to go back to Egypt, after having left Egypt afraid because he had uh, slain an Egyptian because of the way the Egyptian was treating the Israelites, and he had left Egypt uh, fleeing for his life, and he had gone, and uh, he had met this man Jethro who had befriended him, and He had stayed there and became a part of Jethro's uh, family by marrying Jethro's daughter and having two grandchildren to Jethro. And he was out watching the uh, sheep of Jethro at the time that the Lord called him through the burning bush. And Moses knew after uh, fighting with God for some time that he was going to have to go to Egypt and deliver the children of Israel as God had told him. And so Moses took his wife, he took his two children, and he headed back for Egypt. Well, there was some conflict along the way, and Moses felt it best, and he sent his wife and children back to stay with her father during the time that he went to Egypt. I think we can learn a lesson from this. You know, the Bible tells us that we're to put God first. It would have been easy for Moses to have said, God, I just can't go. My family needs me. But God impressed upon Moses that he had a job to do. You and I could learn from that today that God ought to take first place in our life and that if he gives us a mission to do, that he's going to provide a way for us to do that if we'll put him first. Here Jethro had now heard that Moses and the children of Israel were free and were in the desert there. And so Jethro had taken his daughter and grandchildren and he was taking them to their rightful place at the side of their husband and father. And so this is where we want to pick the story up and look at it today and see what had happened. Jethro took the uh, family there, and Moses heard that they were coming, and Moses hurried out to meet them. How excited he must have been. He was going to see his wife. He was going to see his children after all that he had been through. Some of you can uh, relate to this. Some of you know how exciting it is when our family has been separated from us for a while to get back together and and how we look forward to that time. And Moses was no different, I'm sure, as he waited there for his family to come back. But I want us to see something 
very important in this lesson today. I want us to see the most important thing that I see in this story. There's many things to be seen. How Moses did what God told him to do. We can see here how the family had been faithful and waited for God to deliver Moses so that they could be reunited again. We could see the faithfulness of this father-in-law who accompanied his daughter and grandchildren uh, to again be with Moses. All of those things are important. But I want us to see a couple of things that can really teach us something today. When Moses saw his family coming, he looked at them. He was excited. He went out, and we're told he greeted his family, and he greeted his father-in-law in a very special way. Uh, he greeted his father-in-law with a hug and a kiss, and they talked about their welfare. How you doing? I'm doing fine. How you doing, son? I'm doing great, Dad. And so he talked to his father-in-law there. And then the scripture tells us that he took his father-in-law and he took him into a tent and he sat down with him and he gave him his testimony. What a wonderful opportunity you and I have. Now we have many things that we use. Uh, every denomination has some witnessing tool and technique. There are courses offered. There are books written. There are all these different ways, but I want to share with you today that your testimony is the greatest witness that you have for Jesus Christ. Your testimony is the most living thing that you can share with someone else. Can you picture for just a few moments as Moses sat in this tent with Jethro, his father-in-law? Now, you've got to understand, when we began reading, it said Jethro was a priest. You might misunderstand there. You might think that Jethro was a big believer in God Almighty. You might think that Jethro was one of the religious leaders of that day that expounded upon God and, and that he taught God. But I think you need to understand today that Jethro was a Midianite priest, but Jethro worshipped many gods. And Jethro led the people in the worship of many gods, not the true living God. And so when Moses took Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest, into that tent, and they sat there, I believe with all my heart that Moses had but one intent, and that was to witness to his father-in-law. And if you'll follow with me for just a few moments, I want to share with you how this must have gone. And I want you to picture them sitting in this tent, Moses and his father-in-law, Jethro. Now, you know, some of us have trouble talking to our family. Some of us have trouble witnessing to our family. Some of us are intimidated. Here was Moses talking to his father-in-law of all people. How many of you men would not dare approach your father-in-law with something? You know, a lot of folks, they're just scared to talk to the father-in-law. But Moses sat him down, and he began to tell him these things. He said, Dad, you remember? You remember I told you before I left about the burning bush and how it wasn't consumed? Well, let me tell you the rest of the story, Dad. I went down into Egypt there, and, and I met Pharaoh face to face, and, and oh, I was frightened when I got there. I didn't know how the children of Israel were going to act. But when I got there and I told the children of Israel that you had sent me, Dad, they accepted me. And that was only through the hand of God, because only that way could they have followed me, because they knew how weak I was, because I had already shown my weakness by running away from the trouble that I was in. But through God, they accepted me. And then uh, Pharaoh wanted to see how things were. He said, I want to see some of this power of this God. And so Pharaoh and his men had rods. And Aaron, who was with Moses, had a rod. And, and they threw those rods down. And, and Dad, let me tell you something. God got into that and Aaron's rod ate all the rods of Pharaoh. That was the very first thing. And boy, you should have seen Pharaoh's face, Dad, when that rod ate all of his rods. And then things began to happen. After I told Pharaoh that he had to let the children of Israel go, he refused. He said, I'll not do it. And God began to send plague after plague after pestilence, trouble, one behind the other. First of all, they went out, Dad, and they walked up to the river as God had told me to have them do. And the whole river was flowing with blood. God had turned the whole river into blood and Pharaoh looked at that and, and he just couldn't believe it, but he still wouldn't let them go. And then, of course, some of you remember several weeks ago, the frogs. 
We studied about the frogs and how God sent the frogs all over everywhere. And after the frogs left, He covered all of the Egyptians with lice. And then the flies came in and covered everything. And then all of the beasts of the land was covered with diseases. And then the beast and every man, woman, boy, and girl of the Egyptians had boils all over them. And then God sent mighty hail from above, giant hail that just destroyed everything. And this was followed by locusts. And then God made it dark for three days. And I love the way they explain that. You go back and study that a, a few chapters earlier. And it said that God made it so dark they could feel it. Have you ever been in dark so dark you could feel it? That's some thick dark. That's like fog so thick that you'd cut it with a knife is the vernacular we talk about today. But this was pitch black dark. I remember, I told somebody about this story. I went and uh, spent the night with my oldest sister in her house, and she lives so far out in the country that they're going to get electricity eventually. <laughs> and, you know, I'm used to living in town, and everybody's got some kind of a light around their house, those lights either on the street out there or something. There's always a light. When you wake up in the middle of the night, there's usually something shining through the window. And I spent the night with my sister, and I was not familiar with the room that I was in and I woke up in the middle of the night and it was so dark I could feel it. You could reach out like that and, and the, the dark was really hard. It was black pitch dark and I got up out of the bed going to go to the door and cross the hall to the restroom and I felt my way around I found the wall. I felt real good about that and I made my way down the wall and I found the door and I found the doorknob and I walked out the door and I got attacked I got attacked by everything. I don't know what it was, but something wrapped all around me, you know, and I began to fight. I was in the closet. <laughs> and I was wrapped up by a bunch of winter coats. And boy, I was fighting those winter coats for all I was worth. That was the darkest dark I'd ever seen. And that to me was, must have been what it was like for three days and nights. It was so black that people couldn't see somebody. They could hold their hand up like that and didn't even know they had one. Moses told Jethro how dark it got for three days and three nights. And then he said, Dad, then the worst thing that you could ever imagine happened. He sent the death angel. He told the children of Israel to take the blood and to put it on both sides and across the top of the doorpost. And we had to stay in our houses we couldn't go outside. You didn't dare go outside because, Dad, the death angel was going to come and the firstborn child of all the Egyptian was going to die. And, Dad, we all stayed in the house and just was awed at what God was doing. As Moses sat there time after time telling his dad what happened, he said, and finally, Dad, he let us go. And we were leaving, and I had all those children of Israel, and I was so excited about getting them out. And, Dad, I look back, and here come Pharaoh. Boy, him and his army, and, and hundreds of the biggest, strongest chariots you've ever seen, and they were coming behind us. And, Dad, I didn't know what I was going to do. I had those children of Israel out there, and they were looking to me for leadership. And we got to the Red Sea, and it was all swollen. And, and Dad, God told me to put my rod out across the sea. And I held a rod out. And Dad, the, the greatest thing you've ever seen happen, the waters just parted back. Great walls of water on both sides, and there wasn't even a mud hole left in the middle. Dad, you'd have had to have seen it to believe it. I wish I'd have had my video camera, Jethro. I'd have, been, I'd have got you a video of that. And we crossed over, and then Pharaoh and all of his army began to come behind, and they got right out in the middle, and when the last child got across that sea, the walls closed up and all the Egyptians and all their chariots were destroyed there and, and boy it was awesome then we got out in the desert and we began to get thirsty and we found a watering hole and we th thought everything was alright and we began to drink water out of that watering hole and pff, it was bitter we couldn't drink it and God told me to throw a tree dad I reached over and got this tree God told me and I threw it in the water and the water became sweet it was awesome. It was an awesome experience. And then we were hungry. And we were out there and the children of Israel were saying, Moses, what are we going to eat? And I was saying, I don't know. I can't tell you. So I said, Lord, 
What are you going to feed these children? I've done what you told me to do. Now how are we going to feed them? And God says, okay, Moses, here's the deal. Every night, every night the camp is going to be overrun by quail. Now some of you have probably seen a covey of quail, 10 or 12 of them running together in a little group. The scriptures tell us that every night the camp was covered with quail, just running around everywhere. You could just reach down and pick up a little quail everywhere. So if you like quail, they had it made. And he said every night the quail came in and we had meat. He said then something really awesome happened. The next morning we woke up and, and the ground was covered with dew. And then as the sun began to come up, Dad, the dew dissipated and there was these little white balls all over the ground. And we were told to take about two and a half quarts. It listed in Omar's here in your Bible. That, that comes out to about 2.87 of a quart per person. They were given specific instructions. You take this much per person and that's what you're going to make your bread out of. They got these little white balls all off the ground and they put them into their containers and they went back and they baked this and they were told to eat every bit of it. Don't leave any of it. That was the very first time that children were told, eat everything on your plate. That was the beginning right there. And so they were told to eat all of it. Don't leave any of it. Well, just like some of us, Dad, they weren't obedient. Some of them ate only half of their ration for the day and they left it. They're going to save it for later. You know, I see a very great, sometimes we miss it. I've missed it many times going through this, but I see a great, great lesson for us here. You know what I think they were doing? I think they were saving it for later. Have you and I ever done that? God, I trust you, but just in case, I'm going to hold on to a little bit for later. I believe they didn't know how long God was going to provide these little white balls. So they said, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to eat just enough to get by. And I'm going to save the rest of it for later. So they put it away. The scriptures tell us that that afternoon, all of that bread that had not been eaten was full of worms. The Bible says it stank. They are going along there, got their little bags over their shoulders, you know, their little backpacks. And, and Mama looked over at Dad and said, what is that? He said, I don't know. It ain't me. And they began to try to find what was stinking. They opened the bags up and the bread they had tried to hoard was full of worms and it stunk. And they had to throw it out. And Moses said, how many times am I going to have to tell you, trust God? Let's stop for just a moment this morning and say, how much faith do you have in God? Or are you saying, God, I'm going to hoard this just in case. God, I'm going to hold on to this just in case. I know I can trust you, but God, I'm going to try to do it myself just in case. And so then they begin to learn their lesson and they ate all of the bread. And so then... They went on a little bit further and they got thirsty again. And dad, let me tell you what happened. God put me at this big rock. And God was standing on top of this rock. And he told me, strike the rock with the rod. I struck it in the sweetest, clearest water you've ever seen. Just gushed right out of the side of the rock. Dad, it was just a sight to behold. And then we became, we, we came upon the, the Amalek and his army. And, oh, we were outnumbered. It looked like the end. And Aaron went down. They began to fight, Lord. They began to fight down there. And, and every time I held the rod up, we were victorious. But my arms got tired. And my arms began to sag down. And Amalek and his army were victorious. And, and I held my arms back up higher. And we were victorious again. And, and then my two aides stood on each side and held my arm up until Amalek and his army were destroyed. Dad, I have had the most awesome experience a man could ever dream of. You should have been there. That was Moses' testimony. 
You may not have a testimony exactly like Moses this morning, but I'm going to tell you, you got a testimony if you've got Jesus in your heart. Because one day you were walking in the wilderness. One day you were walking in the desert. One day you were missing Jesus in your heart. And then you found Jesus. Whatever means, whoever witnessed to you, whether you were in church, at work, or at home, or driving in your car, however you met Jesus, and you invited him to come into your heart, and you've never been hungry or thirsty again because he's taken care of all of your needs, you've got a testimony this morning. And what will your testimony do? Well, let me show you. It goes on in the next verses to say that Jethro looked at Moses and he said, Moses, indeed, God is the true living God. Look there in that 10th verse of chapter 18. Jethro said, blessed be the Lord. He didn't say blessed be some God. Blessed be the Lord. He said blessed be the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. And then look at that 11th verse, the greatest thing that a man could ever say, Jethro said in that 11th verse, now I know. Once I was lost, but now I'm found. Once I was blind, but now I see. Once I didn't know anything about Christ, but now I know that I know. Brother W.K. said, boy, I'm proud of this. Jethro said, now I know. I'm proud to know. My friends, everybody in this room ought to be proud to know today that you know Jesus. He said, now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods. Because you see, Moses had told him the whole story of how all these others had tried to get their gods to come against the God, the only true living God, and how God had prevailed over all. And just like today, we would give our testimony and somebody would come to a point of knowing Jesus Christ and they would say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me where I fail you. Lord, come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior and come to know Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. Jethro did that equivalent. You notice in that 12th verse it says, Then Jethro, the priest who had taught other gods all of his life, then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. He turned to the true living God. What turned him around after all these years, after God striving with him year after year after year, what finally turned him around? The testimony of his son-in-law, a witness from a family member. I don't know how your witness is today. I don't know if your family is whole. I don't know if all of your children know Jesus. I don't know if your parents know Jesus. I don't know if your brothers and sisters know Jesus, but I know this today. If you know Jesus, you've got a testimony in your heart. And just like Moses, you can share it with your family. And then when the Lord comes, as James mentioned this morning, the family circle won't be broken. Won't it be a joy for the family circle to be unbroken? Mom and dad and the children and the grandparents and all standing around holding hands around the throne of God. Let the circle not be broken because of your testimony in their life. And do other people care outside of the family? Absolutely. In that 12th verse, it finishes up and it says, Aaron and all of the elders of Israel came and rejoiced with Jethro. Not only did they come, but the scriptures tell us that when one comes to know Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, that the angels in heaven rejoice. Oh, if you want to hear some rejoicing, you come this morning and make Jesus your personal Lord and Savior. Everybody in this room will rejoice with you if you'll do that. The elders, the, the young people, everybody will be excited about that. Everybody will be as excited about your coming to know Jesus as we were excited about Brother W.K. coming, as he was excited about coming to know Jesus and, and being faithful to him. And not only that, but every angel in heaven will be having a wonderful, wonderful time. I can only imagine what it's like up there when one down here comes to know Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. I, I think it was just a wonderful time. I can just picture Jethro and Moses and Aaron and all the elders as they ate together and fellowshiped together and as they celebrated together as Jethro 
came to know the true living God. How is your family today? How is your witness today? Never give up on anyone. Never say it's too late. Never say that that person is hard-hearted. Never say that that person will never come to know Jesus Christ. If there was ever somebody that you'd give up on, it would probably have been Jethro, the Midianite priest. He is so steeped in tradition, Moses could have said. He has been worshiping false gods for so long, you ain't going to never change that man's mind, Moses might have said. He's too old to learn new tricks, Moses might have said. I don't want to bother him because he's going to think I'm a fanatic. Moses could have said all those things, but let me tell you what Moses said one more time. He said, Dad, I'm so glad to see you. Thank you for bringing my family. Now come on inside. Let me just tell you what God done in my life. And he sat down and he told him about God. And Jethro made a life-changing change in his life that day. What about your life this day? Will you make a life-changing decision in your life today? If you've never met Jesus face to face, you've heard the testimony of Moses. Perhaps you've heard the testimony of others and you might need to come today and invite Jesus to come into your heart. Maybe you've done that, but you've never let others celebrate with you by coming and making public your profession of faith and being baptized. You've never given the angels the opportunity to rejoice. You've never given the church the opportunity to rejoice. You come today and give us that opportunity. Maybe you don't have a church home in which you're serving. Moses had a witness because he had been faithful to God. You and I need a witness today to say, I'm a part of this local church. I'm a teacher. I'm a worker. I'm a member. I sing in the choir. I'm faithful on Sunday because I'm a part of this local fellowship. That's my testimony today. Let that be part of your testimony. If you don't have that, you come today and make that your testimony. Maybe you've done all those things. You be praying today that your witness will be such that others will come to know God through you. Let's stand together. Our hymn of invitation is hymn 320. Hymn 320, it says, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. Moses had looked in the face of God many times and said, what am I going to do? And God had been there for him. Today, won't you look into the face of our living Lord Jesus Christ and let him give you a testimony in your life. Lord, we come before you now at this time of invitation. Lord, may your will be done. May this testimony touch our heart and may our testimony be as exciting May it be as fervent. May it be given as quickly to those we come to know. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.